some physical labor. Okay, here we go. But I'm looking forward to it. I can get myself over to our Facebook page. And we actually have a couple of people watching on Facebook. Thanks for joining us. We'll get started here in just a minute. I love seeing people join through Facebook, especially on an afternoon. Maybe it's pretty windy out, so maybe being inside uh, for a workshop is the best alternative for this afternoon. All right, well, I think I'll get us started. Uh, my name is Wing Grabowski. I work with the city of Portland. I'm one of the coordinators with the Six Affairs, which are uh, normally would be in-person events that bring you community resources uh, that we moved to an online model during the pandemic. And um, hopefully we'll be returning to in-person this fall. Um, and today we have Lori, a volunteer with Financial Beginnings Oregon. Lori, thank you so much for joining us always appreciated. And I'll let you take it from here. All right. Thank you, Wing, for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Lori Williams, and I'm with the United Community Credit Union, and we have this great partnership with Financial Beginnings so that I can bring you today protecting yourself. And when we're going to be talking about protecting yourself, we're going to be talking about fraud, ID theft, and then different types of insurance, and really the value and importance of it. And I hope that you all gain some better understanding. All right, so here we go. Protecting yourself. What does it mean to protect yourself? Well, we're gonna start off today with a question. Does anyone in our audience know or have you ever experienced identity theft or where you find out that someone has access and is trying to open up uh, credit cards or was able to get into your account? I, for one, can speak out of my own experience that I have had someone use a credit card of mine many years ago. This was many years ago. I'll never forget that call. I'll just share my experience. I was in my 20s. And I had just moved down to Southern California. And at this time, I would typically use my American Express credit card. Instead of a gas card, I would use my American Express. And at that time, American Express would require that you paid off your balance every month. So I found that a really great card and I would use it. And I was at work one day and I received this call. And they, of course, um, introduce themselves. Hello, is this Miss Williams? Yes, this is. And um, they basically said that they were giving me a courtesy call because my balance, they saw activity that wasn't normal, that I had a balance of about $20,000. And I remember like it was yesterday, I started laughing and I said to them, I think you have the wrong person. Um, remember, I was freshly into my 20s. I knew nothing about identity theft. I knew nothing about fraud. And the next thing I knew, the representative with American Express, who was so kind and so gracious with me, went to ask me a couple of personal questions on where I lived. And as I realized that they did have the right Lori Williams, I started to cry on the phone, I was living in Southern California, I was working, I, I had no idea what it meant that someone stole my credit card and that I had a balance of $20,000 and I did not have $20,000. So what was great about this experience is that I learned a lot. And what I learned with your credit card, and especially if you use a credit card, that if if this is not you that made those purchases, they will research it, they will review it. And if anything, you may be responsible for $50, or if they find and they research it and see that this was not you, then they will take 
uh, that is a loss and you are not held accountable for that. So that's why it's really important if you see anything on your credit cards or within your savings and checking account that looks a little off to make sure that you call your financial institution. Because what's really great, again, in my situation with the credit card is that I was not responsible. And like I said, I started crying because I was so responsible with my debt and I, I just knew nothing about any of this. So it was so reassuring to know that they were gonna investigate it. And once they were able to determine that it was not me, that I would be taken care of and, and not responsible for that. And they were gonna send me a new card. Um, so that was, that was just one of my life experiences. I remember probably about eight years ago, I had just come back from vacation. My daughters and I had gone to California for a softball tournament, and then we came home and we went straight over to Eastern Oregon for a family vacation. And I was driving home and I had actually registered myself with Credit Karma. And I like the tools on Credit Karma. I have the tools within my credit unions. But for me, I just enjoy looking at all the different models. I'm in the financial industry. Prior to being the financial education specialist, I worked in business development. I worked in underwriting and I did home loans for many, many years. So it's just so interesting for me to see all the changes in the credit industry and just to hear about all the different experiences and stories. So moving forward, I remember stopping off in Hood River. It was a Sunday. I would normally never check my email. I don't even know what possessed me to check my email, but I went into the Starbucks. It was in the late afternoon, summertime. I needed a little pick me up. And I checked my emails and I had an email from Credit Karma that basically when I had signed up, they will send you alerts and basically send you an email that says, hey, we noticed there's been um, an application for a credit card. Is this you? We see on TransUnion, it's reporting. Well, I had just been on vacation and I had three of these emails and that was not me. So what was really great for me is because I was signed up, they had sent me a notification in the form of an email and I was able to call uh, they had all the information, the stores, the phone number so that I could call. And there was one credit card specifically that they were ready to issue and how they issue oftentimes now is that if you apply for a credit card, they'll send you the information via email so that if you want to charge something right away online, you have all of your card information. So I was able to call them just in time on one of the credit cards so that they did not release that information via the email. And what that really helped me with was if I had not been signed up with Credit Karma, if I had not received these emails so that I could call these creditors and say, this was not me, I would have found out that there were credit cards open to my name probably about 10 days later, because that's usually once a credit card has been issued, they send it in the mail. And I would say it usually takes up to about 10 business days. And at that time, I would have had one of these credit cards probably um, absolutely fully charged. And what the representative on one of the credit cards had expressed to me that it is really common that when people are um, stealing identity or they are able to get people's information that they will go online and then they'll purchase a very expensive, for instance, a MacBook, something very, very expensive that they can turn around and sell. So those are just two of my own personal experiences. When I did home loans, it was the most frustrating thing that when someone would come to buy a, a, a new home and we did have, I remember specifically, we had one transaction, it was someone in my office who was working with a buyer and they were looking for a home. And I, I think that, that she probably worked with these home buyers for about 60 to 90 days. So we had a credit report that had expired and we needed to repull credit and their credit score had dropped almost 150 points. And unbeknownst to these home buyers and these shoppers, someone had was able to find their information and had opened up new accounts 
and somehow trailed the mail so they never even received it and so they had all these lates um you know even if it was only 30 days so their credit score that was above 740 had had dropped down dramatically it, it was a really horrible experience because Basically, if they would have kept moving forward to buy their home, we, we had to use that credit score that had dropped and this was completely out of their control. So these are just some um, experiences and we wanna make sure that you're protecting yourself and taking measurements so that you don't have to go through this. What are some ways to protect, protect yourself financially? Well, let's start with why are we here today? We are here so that you can get some great tips and tricks, especially for your own personal accounts um, with your debit cards and your credit cards so that you don't have to experience this. We want to explore some different strategies and actions that you can take and you can take them today or tomorrow. Super simple. All right. I already asked this one, have you or someone you know been a victim of fraud? Again, I shared with you some information and some experiences. They were not pleasant. They are very stressful. And I'm sure that if you do know someone that has gone through these, you probably can remember because anyone that experiences this, especially when they work so hard, it's, it's a matter of behavior of keeping your credit on time and perfect and it takes only 30 days or one incident in life that can cause um, something with fraud. Uh, dumpster diving, skimming, changing your address, old fashioned stealing, pretexting. These are all different ways that people are able to gain access to your personal information. Dumpster diving is probably the oldest and one of the biggest areas where we've really been able to dial in and share with consumers and our communities about shredding documents. Anytime that you get those notices, sometimes we at the credit union, other financial institutions, uh, chamber of commerces. Uh, I live in Gresham, so the city of Gresham before has sent out notifications that they were gonna have a recycling um, shredding center. It's a great time to take your papers. Um, you want to make sure that you are destroying the paperwork that goes into your garbage or your recycle. That is a very easy way to access personal information. Skimming is a lot more sophisticated. So skimming is something that when you and I go and use our debit card, uh, if we go to an ATM, an automated teller machine, and we try to take cash out, there is a device that's attached that is very, it would be very difficult um, for someone that's not an expert in this, when you put your card in, basically this skimming device is taking all of your information, all of your personal information. So as soon as you take it out, someone is able to access into your account. And when we find these, at least from a financial institution, this was a really interesting thing for me to learn. When these skimming machines are on our automated teller machines, it is a lot of money to replace those ATM machines. So it, it doesn't just affect the consumer, it also affects the financial institution. It always affects the financial institution. And the more that it affects the financial institution, the more it affects us as consumers because it's a loss of money. Changing your address, this is a big thing. This is why, there are so many mailboxes that have locks now. Uh, there are so many people that use their post office box because all it takes is for one person to walk by your mailbox, take out your mail, they'll see your information and they can put in a change of address. And for the most part, have a lot of your information. Uh, your social security number is something that's really important but you just never know what comes in people's mail. Old fashioned stealing, that's, that's a given one. If you have anything in your wallet, if you have your identification, and if you carry your social security card in your wallet and someone steals your wallet or your purse, they are going to be able to apply and probably open up many accounts. The reason that I say they probably will is because if they go online, there's no one to check that picture ID. I've been in a store when I opened up a new credit card and 
Uh, they did not check my ID. So I can highly share with all of you, do not be offended if someone wants to check your ID. It's really a benefit and a protecting yourself. Pretexting. This is an, another interesting one. This is one that if you get a text message or you might get an email or another way that people will address this is that you'll get a phone call. Um, it is the most interesting thing if most credit unions, financial institutions, the IRS, they are going to identify themselves really well. Be very, very careful who you give your information out. When you get a phishing email, I just received one the other day where I could claim $250. I don't use my PayPal account very often. This was a random email that stated that I could win $250 if I um, did something very simple. And of course I did not do it, but it would be so simple for me to respond and follow through with that to earn $250. The reason I didn't do it is because I do work in the financial industry and I do hear all of these stories. So be very, very careful when you receive emails that ask you to link on to something and share your information. If you get a call from someone saying that they're trying to collect the debt and they need your information, be very careful. Make sure that you're fact checking who is contacting you. All right, so here we go. Shred it. Don't give out account information, including passwords or pins. If you give out your password or your pin, and we do see this, it could be a family member, a friend. If that friend or that family member goes back, and takes money out of your account or uses your credit card when you did not allow them at that time, because at some point you gave them that information, then it is really gonna come back on you more than likely. So be very careful. Report fraud immediately. A lot of people do not check their accounts. Make sure that you're looking at your statements. Make sure that you're looking at your transactions in your debit. Oftentimes when you hear about these security breaches, this is because they've been able, um, Target's a really great example. It, these larger companies, and I can tell you from a financial institution, spend a lot of money on protecting your identity, my identity, anyone's identity that shops there, all of our information. But there are people in this world that are very brilliant and their goal and their mental stimulation is hacking in and breaking into these systems so that they can sell this information. So when this happens, you might hear about this um, breach and you may not do anything about it. This is, if you don't do anything about it, you at least wanna be checking your accounts because what happens is you could have money in your account and someone might take 76 cents out. And that's how they're gonna test if they can get in and out of your account. And then what will happen is if you don't notice that, you don't have anything to report and one day you go to your account and you might not have anything, everything could be wiped out. So we do see that. Again, do not carry your social security card in your wallet. And the reason is if your social security card and your identification card or your driver's license are in your wallet, they have absolutely everything to go online and apply for new credit cards and charge online within two hours, they can, they can do a lot of damage. And for you, it takes a very long time. Once someone has opened an account and used that account, it really does take a long time for you as the consumer to fix these situations. It's a very long and frustrating situation. Watch for account make sure that you're checking to see if you see anything irregular. All right, what do you do if it happens to you? Again, notify the company as soon as you discover the fraud. Freeze your bank accounts, obtain a free credit report to see if there are any additional issues. File a police report. I would just file 
a police report right away. And the reason is, is because the credit card companies, the financial institutions, they want to see that you did file this. And you will need this because when you are trying to repair what you did not do to your credit, the credit bureaus will also ask for these police reports. Something else is you can get an annual report every single year. Um, credit report, annualcreditreport.com, www.annualcreditreport.com. You can go on there and annually you can get a free credit report. What's really nice, those credit reports are a little bit more sophisticated. And when I say sophisticated, if you are not accustomed to reading credit reports, they are a little bit more difficult to follow. Check with your financial institution and see if you have access to monthly credit report access. Most financial institutions really provide that through one of the credit bureaus. Something else that I would highly suggest, this is the easiest thing that you can do to protect yourself. And you can do it today, you can do it tomorrow, in the next week, I challenge you. Set up, if you do mobile banking, and if you don't do mobile banking, you can go into your local branch, but set up personal notifications. What's really great about having access to a phone and mobile banking is that you can customize notifications on all of your accounts. Uh, for instance, if I have a debit card, I can customize notifications for myself that sets me up for text alerts or a phone call. I can set it up so that I, if I go $50, if I hit $50 and below, I get a text alert. If I have a purchase that wants to go through my account for more than $300, I will get a text alert. I actually have mine set up that if I get one of those alerts, I have to call them back. And I think it's actually for $500. I have to call them back and then let them know, yes, this is me. But it's really helpful because this is how you don't often know, most of us do not know when someone has access to our information. So you can do that with your debit cards, you can do that with your checking accounts, and you can do it with all of your credit cards. What I really love is I have a couple credit cards that every week I also get what my current balance is. So I get lots of text alerts and I just really enjoy that because I have a very busy life and my past experience, I'm working in the financial industry, I just know that things can happen. And our credit really is important and fraud and identity theft really makes a very big impact and it takes so long to get that cleared up and we have no control over when this happens in our life. All right, let's go on to something else that we need to protect ourselves. And we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about insurance. Oh, here's our slide that lets you know, going back to what I said, if you really are concerned about future fraud, you can put a freeze on your credit. I did forget this. So what happens oftentimes, usually with people that have had their identity stolen or they've had any one be able to access funds from their checking or savings is they will put freeze on those accounts and anytime they will put freeze on credit reports so that anytime if they go to apply for new credit it is a process they have to make a phone call um, they have to authorize this i really saw this a lot when i did mortgages and i always just felt really bad for that consumer because usually they had a really horrible story, but it does take an extra maybe 30 minutes to an hour when you have these protections put in place, but they are so helpful. And this might be something when you know you're getting ready as you're building credit, or if you know you're getting ready to make a home purchase, maybe this is something you might want to look into is putting in notifications, setting up um, freezes or protections for your credit cards and your accounts. All right, how does insurance protect us financially? It protects us in a lot of ways. And as we go and talk about a couple different insurances, really something that I want you to think about is risk management. 
when we talk about insurance and how that protects, protects us financially, it's really coming down to risk management. Calculating possible loss. The reality is every single day we face a lot of risk. Just walking out of your house, walking to the mailbox. Uh, I had a friend that was out walking one day and he broke his ankle. However, he stepped off the curb, he ended up breaking his ankle. It was at a busy intersection. When you get in your car, they say that most car accidents are within a mile of your home. And these reports are because they track they track and research all every single accident. That's why we have to file re, um, police reports is because they're tracking this, they're researching it. And all of this research is to give us some idea of what the risk management is. So calculating possible losses, do I have collision coverage on my car? Worst case, what's the value of your car? Do I have health insurance? Your worst case insurance when you have health insurance is you can't determine how much you want to have. When we talk about collision coverage on a car, I'll give you a really good example. We want to look at what the value of the car is. We have three cars in my family. My daughters each have a car and we have a car. One of the automobiles is a 2000 Super Beetle. And this 2000 Super Beetle, I think we purchased it for about $5,500 about five years ago. We don't have 100,000 miles on it um, at this time, but that was initially for my girls to be driving back and forth to school, sports events. Well, I have collision coverage so that if there was an accident, it would definitely take care of someone. It would take care of injuries, but it would not replace that automobile. And the reason is, is because it has lessened in value. We purchased it for 5,500. If I wanted to repurchase it, or if I wanted to sell it, I might get $3,000. So when I look at the cost of coverage to have full insurance, it doesn't really balance out. So that's one really good example. Here's another great example. One of my daughters just paid off her car and she has a 2013 Ford Fusion. In this particular case, she did not have 100,000 miles. This was something that she wanted to continue to make sure that she had a full coverage and pay a little bit more in her insurance. And the reason is, is she is 20 and she worked really hard to save up the money to purchase this car as well as to monthly pay it off in a quick time. If she was in a car accident, her car would not be considered totaled out um, as far as value. So her car still has some good value. If she went and turned around and tried to sell it, uh, she'd probably be able to sell it for anywhere from $8,800 to $10,000. So in her particular case, it is worth paying and having the full coverage on that automobile. Because if she was in an accident, and she had to go out and buy a new car and have another monthly payment, it would be excruciating for her. There was a purpose for her to um, accelerate on her payments to get that car paid off. Health insurance. Again, this is going to be really depending on the amount and how many family members you have and what you need. Weighing the risk. So this is the great thing. When you are weighing the risk, you, when you pay for insurance, you have peace of mind, you pay a premium, you pay a monthly amount typically, or if it's car insurance, I know I pay my car insurance off every six months I pay it, I get a discount, which I really appreciate. And I'm sure that the discount is offered so that the insurance company knows six months worth of payment has been received. The other way you know, are you leveraging is there is always risk involved. Every single day we have risk involved. Um, there's likelihood of loss, there's maximum exposure. And likelihood of loss is a really great example when I use the two automobiles. 
knowing that our Volkswagen bug is only valued maybe at $3,000, when I looked at how much it would cost me to carry full coverage, it really wasn't worth it. In my daughter's situation with her automobile being valued $8,800 up to $10,000, that is well worth having that extra payment. She cannot afford the likelihood of loss because getting to her job is, um, you know, part of how she makes her income and she is a full time student. And if you can hear my lovely animals in the background, I apologize. I think Amazon might be in the neighborhood. All right, let's go to the next slide. Here are some common types of insurance that uh, most of us are aware of. If you are a driver, you are going to have to have auto insurance. If you are a homeowner, if you have any type of loan on your home, you are required to have homeowner's insurance. And that homeowner's insurance is that if your house burns down, if something happens to it, the mortgage holder requires proof of payment on that every year. If you, if you ever receive anything in the mail, where your mortgage holder is asking you for proof of insurance, make sure you get that to them because in your paperwork, if you do not provide proof or you let your homeowners lapse, they are entitled to put homeowners insurance on that home. And oftentimes those policies are between $3,500 to $5,000. And that's a year. Most commonly, you get to pick out your homeowner's insurance, and it can range between $500 and $3,000. Uh, it's very universal. It depends on what you're insuring. It depends on the square footage, what you have in your home. All of those things go into effect. Renter's insurance. Renter's insurance is way cheaper. This could be as cheap as $100 to $200 a year. Renter's insurance, if you are renting, this is so valuable. And I'm going to share a couple of reasons why. When you are renting, you do not own the home. If you live in an apartment complex, most apartment complexes are touching walls to walls. And typically the units are layered. So you have a bottom level, you have a middle level, maybe a third level. So what happens is your homes are stacked on top of each other. If there was someone in, let's say, the second or third floor, and they go off to work, everyone's at work during the day, one of the pipes burst in the top unit on the third floor. Let's just say um, something happened, we have a freeze, these pipes on the third floor freeze and the water is um, just pile, it's flooding the apartment, but it's not just flooding the apartment, it's coming through the roof and it's gonna affect maybe the second apartment and it's gonna come through the roof. If this is flooding and or the pipes break with all three different apartments, if you have bedding, if you have TVs, if you have computers, if you have a gaming system, if you have a couch, Anything that is on that ground or touching that ground can be destroyed. Here's another example. If you are living in a town home or an apartment or even a home, if you are renting, specifically the town home, duplex and apartments, because in most cases, those are units where the walls are touching each other. That is what attaches these units. And what can happen is, let's just say, that one night someone falls asleep, they had a candle lit and they have a cat that crawls up on the counter and the cat got up on the counter, accidentally knocked the candle over onto the carpet and you have a full blown fire. If that fire starts in one apartment, it can easily be spread and ruin the whole complex. And these are things that we see. When, when I did home loans, we could not fund the loan. We could not let proceeds go. When a new person was buying a home, we had to make sure that we had the homeowner's insurance binder of the home that they were purchasing. And we had to make sure that that check was going out that day. And the reason is, is because 
in between funding a home loan for a new borrower, you've got to have insurance in place because especially in the mortgage business, there's been several times where in between one person moving in and one per person moving out, the house caught on fire and was destroyed. So that's really important. Something that I just saw recently on Facebook, one of my friends posted this, and then I actually just saw this on my own. She had posted that in her son's room, she just happened to look down at the plug-in outlet and the phone charger for the Apple phone, she saw the copper wires. So this charger could have probably started a fire. Well, I just saw one of my chargers the other day, and I think this was really fresh in my mind. So make sure that you're looking at these things as well. Anything within your outlets, there are times when um, rodents can be in the wall of a home. Uh, here's another really unfortunate example for a homeowner. Nothing to do with the homeowner. All of a sudden, they come home and their kitchen is on fire. What's really great, the fire department's able to put the fire out and they don't have to demolish the home, but they have to rebuild that part of the kitchen. And this, I believe I have two examples for you. One was a, just where the wires went out, something caught on fire, it was an older home. The other one where, was where there were rodents that were chewing on these wires. And in both of these, I know two people that actually experienced this within their kitchen. So what happens is not only did they have a fire in their kitchen, um, and so you have to go through a whole process because of smoke and damage. Uh, if, if you owe, if you have money and a mortgage, this is why you pay for the insurance. You have no control. You didn't start this fire. But where are you going to live if it takes six months to repair this kitchen? Same with your renters. If your apartment burned down or if it flooded, where would you live for six months or 12 months, however long it takes to rebuild that so that you can go back there and live there. That is part of a lot of insurance policies. That's a choice that you have. Health insurance, we have no control oftentimes about what's going on with our health. Um, health insurance is probably the most costly insurance, but it also provides probably the most biggest benefits because sometimes our health we can have issues with our health that will continue throughout our lives. And it could be a nonstop with medical bills. Life insurance and disability. Life insurance, I think life insurance is really good once you start a family or if you have a spouse, life insurance helps because if something happens to, if there are two of you that make the house payment, if there are two of you that pay rent, if there are two of you that contribute towards automobile payments, and if one of you loses your life and you are accustomed to two monthly incomes, there is going to be a ripple effect. So life insurance is important. Disability. I think disability insurance, if you can take that, uh, some careers and professions, disability insurance is really great. Uh, for example, firemen, police officers, people in construction when they're building new units, or if they have something fall on their foot and, or if they have something fall on their hand and they can't finish building and that's their career. So these are just some really great things. Things that aren't mentioned, um, pet, pet insurance, that has become a really big thing. Uh, motorcycle insurance, motor insurance. There's also specialty insurance. If you are a rare collector of stamps, if you're a rare collector of coins, there's all kinds of different insurance. Fun fact, if you were an entertainer, you would probably have in place some type of life insurance policy to supplement your income in case something happened to you. A really good example would be um, David Beckman, Beckham that plays soccer. He is a professional soccer player. He's actually a retired soccer player, but um, he had his legs insured. And the reason he had his legs insured, because he was such a phenomenal global soccer player, he made a lot of money. And then not only that, but he was able to do a lot of modeling jobs 
And a lot of those modeling jobs included, um, you know, his physique in that. So he was able to make a lot of income by being in good physical shape. So I know that's a little, a little bit different, but that's always a fun fact that I love sharing and that I've learned since I've done these financial workshops. All right, here's some basics about auto insurance. Risk pooling, insurance policy, the premium and the liability. This is all that goes into when you have an insurance policy. We all are to pay for insurance. That's pulling money together in case of a loss. I think that the it's one in 76 people are gonna get in a car accident. Not everyone's gonna experience having a car accident. You're so lucky if you never experience that. I've been rear-ended, I think three, three times. Um, and I'm glad that's all it's been, but my girls were in an accident the first six months that they started driving. I was, I pulled in front of a car the first six months that I was driving with my parents' automobile. So risk pooling is where we all pay for insurance. Then we have our insurance policy. That is the contract between you and the insurance company. And you get to pick, we have set rules and guidelines that you will have. And then there are things that you can also pick and add. The premium, this is the amount that you pay for the insurance. This is the cost for you to have that peace of mind. The liability, that is the coverage to protect others for damage you cause them. So the liability is really important. We carry insurance because when we get in our cars or if we're out chopping down some tree branches, we accidentally, that's why they call it accidentally, could miss something and cause an accident. I have caused an accident. I was liable for that. Uh, here's a really great example. My dad used to work at a grocery store named Kino's and they had a really great big, the front of the store was nothing but big windows. So people could just pull up to the curb, park and go in the store. I think there was on two or three different occasions where people would put their groceries in their car. And then instead of putting their cars in reverse and backing out, they put their cars in drive and went through the window of the store. Thank goodness there was never a customer injured. Thank goodness there was never ever a um, an employee that was injured. But this is what liability is for. A really good example would be when you drive over Mount Hood. If you drive over Mount Hood, you will see that there are signs that give you deer warning. If you drive to the beach, you will see these signs that say they're yellow and they'll have a picture of a deer. The reason those are there is because automobiles hit these deer and the deer just come out of nowhere. There are certain seasons of the year, they're really gonna be coming out. And when that happens, there's typically abundant amount of damage to the automobiles. So that's why those warning signs are there is be careful because there's a good chance of an accident. All right, drivers are legally required to have general liability. This includes bodily injury per person, bodily injury per accident, and then property damage. So in the state of Oregon, the bodily injury per person is $25,000. The bodily injury per accident is 50,000. The property damage is 20. So those are the guidelines. The bodily injury per person is 25,000. The issue is what if you had six people in a car and there was an accident and um, in the bodily injury per accident that is per accident 50,000 so if there are six people some may be injured more than others some may be injured so bad that they are never able to work again and that's where insurance really comes in for the risks that are taken so bodily injury per accident you have options and choices if you ever want to increase that bodily injury per person and property damage as well other areas of why those could be good possibilities is you will hear that there are some accidents that are so severe that they will sue if you own a home. They may come after you for your home. They may come after you for your business. 
So that is why when we talk about different policies, it's really important to understand that we have a basic guideline and then you have more choices to choose from. The property damage is pretty good. Um, and I'll just give you another example. And these, I don't think that anyone has the intention of driving out of their driveway and causing an accident. But these things do happen. I know I've been driving before where I had a car. I'll never forget this. It was the 4th of July. My girls and I were driving five minutes from our house to go um, spend the evening with some friends. We had spent the day with some other friends. Now we were going to go get ready. It was about seven o'clock at night. Took a back road that I know like the back of my hand. Five minutes. I left my phone at home because we were just going a very short distance. And as I'm on this back road going forward, all of a sudden here comes a car. It was like out of a movie, just rolling and crashing. And if I would have been 15 seconds ahead of where I was, the car would have hit our automobile. Um, the car ended up upside down in a ditch and I did not have my phone. My girls were young. I remember my youngest was still in her booster seat. So I backed up the car. And really, I backed up the car because I didn't know if the other automobile was going to explode. And all I could think to myself was, please don't let there be someone that is deceased. And please don't let there be a baby in there that um, there was, it was very frightening, to be honest with you. I did not know what I was going to find. So as I take my car, I back it up, and then I walk over to the car. I want to check on whoever's in there. It was one 16-year-old girl. Her name was Hannah, and I'm going to share her name. Uh, I don't have to share her full name, but she had just turned 16. It had been a month, and uh, it was very obvious that she was in shock, and all she kept saying was, I wasn't speeding. I wasn't speeding. Um, more than likely, I think that she wasn't like speeding, speeding, but those curves were for about 30 miles an hour and she was coming down these curves. And I think that um, somehow she lost control. Uh, the great news was, is that we were able to keep her calm and I was able to call her mom and dad. And because the car crashing was so loud, someone else had already called the fire department. Um, so that was really great. I tried, when we made the phone call, I just tried to let her parents know. I, you know, just want to let them know that their daughter was standing there next to me and where we were located, but there had been an accident. So I'll never forget that because all I could think was 15 seconds faster, her car would have impacted our car and my girls were so little. All I could think was, what, you know, what were the injuries that would have happened? Thank goodness it didn't. All right, auto policy breakdown. So required by law, general liability and uninsured motorist. So the reason that they have the uninsured motorist is because there are so many people out there driving not with insurance. And if someone doesn't have insurance, that means that you have to talk to your insurance company. So what's happening is insurance company, uh, financial institutions, when they have to pay out a lot of money, we are all affected by that. We are affected by new policies. We are affected with the cost out of our pocket. It does triple down um, to all of us. We do pay for that. So those are required by law. Optional is. Oh, let me just get back to that. Optional is underinsured motorist, gap insurance, rental car, and roadside assistance. And then you've got required and optional insurance, which are in the middle column, collision, comprehensive, and personal injury protection. So I'm going to share something with you under the optional. I would say that I use, for me, I do not use the roadside assistance. When I looked at the cost, I think for my insurance policy, it was about $7. That's my alarm. It was about $7 a month for my automobile insurance. What I did is I just went ahead and purchased triple A. Uh, AAA comes in great for me and my girls. It's not only to help us get towed, but it's if we lose our key, if our batteries go dead. And I found that that was more cost effective. Rental car. I've had rental car in my insurance policy and I've had it 
not in my, the one time I think that I did not have uh, that extra built into my insurance policy is when my girls crashed our car and it was totaled. Thank goodness no one was hurt, but the car was totaled. And for about a month, um, it was really stressful in the aspect that we had one car at the time. And um, basically, I didn't know how much my insurance was going to go up. The car was paid off. So now I was going to have a car payment. I didn't know what the increased insurance was going to be. Uh, there was a lot of factors that went into place that I had to think about. And I knew now that I didn't have an automobile. I wanted to make sure that the next automobile that I chose was something I was going to have for about a good 10 years. So it was interesting. I would walk, thank goodness, there's a close bus stop by my house and I would walk to the bus stop and then that would take me to the light rail and then I could get downtown and it all worked out really great. And I had two great legs to walk me to the bus stop. So that did work out, but it was really, really stressful. Uh, so just make sure that you're looking through these things because these are all things involved. Gap insurance is something when you, if you buy a brand new car or you buy a newer car, gap insurance for some, it fits for them and others, it doesn't. But basically what happens when you buy an automobile, oftentimes it's going to lose its value. It's going to start depreciating quickly. So gap insurance is, for instance, if you bought a $20,000 automobile, and if you took a seven-year loan, because that payment was more affordable over a four-year loan, if you're into about your seventh year, and you owe on that car more than it's worth, that's going to be a problem. There's nothing worse than having your car totaled not having an automobile and you still have to make automobile payments. So that is what gap insurance does. And that's what the availability is. And, and it does drive a good purpose. It just really depends on a couple different factors. So keep that in mind when you're car shopping and how long of a term you're taking on your loan. All right, here's some numbers that I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier. Homeowners, the average cost is about 500 to 2000 thousand annually that's the average it can be more and i will share with you i know that my i just paid mine in january for the year and my homeowners insurance went up my automobile insurance went up right now it's very interesting the cost of goods have gone up we're all experienced that with just the price of gas and groceries but this also affects your policies i actually had made a phone call in regards to my my automobile insurance. The other thing that I found really interesting was it seems that due to the last two years of multiple factors that it's hard to get parts in. So that's been a big thing. You've got a labor shortage in a lot of areas because there are not people working. And then now you don't have the parts to fix these um, automobiles and the cost of the goods has gone up. Um, so really interesting in that homeowners, same with renters, but renters is typically very affordable, very low. If you thought about how much a bedroom set cost, how much a couch cost, how much does your laptop cost, how much does your gaming, uh, your kitchen table, how about your alarm, all your bathroom utensils, your shoes, your clothes, those are all factors that you have to replace. So the one thing when you have your renters is you get to choose, do you wanna have a replacement value or cash value? And the difference right there is if you take the replacement value, that insurance will cost you a little bit more money. But here's the example. If you've had your laptop for three years, if you take the cash value, your laptop depreciates very quickly. It may You may have paid $1,000 and it may only be worth $50 now. You take the replacement and you pay a little bit more for your insurance then you get to go buy a brand new one. So there's just a really good example of the options available for that. Um, going back to homeowners, you've got personal property coverage, liability coverage, additional living expenses. That was something I really wanted to share with you um, that you have to think about if something happens to your home and it needs to be repaired. In the case of two people that I know with the fires in their kitchen, the additional living expenses set them up 
in a home. There are also some types of motels where people will live or um, insurance companies will own these homes for these purposes. Uh, the dwelling coverage optional is flood insurance, personal articles floater. So in the flood insurance, for any of you that want to live up the mountain or live next to a river, be prepared that they will know if you are in a flood zone. And if you are in a flood zone, then you will also be required to pay flood insurance. On the renters, same thing if you are in a flood zone. Personal property coverage, liability, and additional living expenses. All right, so we've got here why health insurance might be required by law in your state, high medical bills, prevention over treatment. The reality is, is because we are faced with risk every day that there could be a no end to medical bills. So health insurance is really important. Some people, I'm very fortunate, I feel very fortunate that I have my health, but some people are born with different things. If you have asthma, if you have allergies, if you are diabetic, or if you weren't diabetic and now you are diabetic, these are all different things that can really impact your lifestyle, your health, and your health can impact your earnings, your revenue, and your life. So that's why health insurance is really important. Or again, what if you had an accident? What if you were driving your car and there was an uninsured motorist that hit you and your auto insurance is not enough? This is really where health insurance is going to come into play. And medical bills can be so expensive. If you were in a coma for six months in the hospital, that's a daily rate. So health insurance is really a must. And just so that you know, health insurance can be a really great benefit and feature of from your employer. So always look at that as an option. All right, life insurance. Need it? Probably if you have children, if you're married, you rely on uh, spouse's income, if you're a business owner. In those areas, life insurance is going to be really helpful. You probably don't need it if you're single with no charity no children, if you're married and you don't rely on a spouse's income, married and or unemployed, you have no dependents at home, or you're retired. Life insurance is uh, lots of different life insurance policies, so you really want to understand those. All right, disability coverage. You are more likely to file a claim with disability insurance while you are working than to file a life insurance claim. And again, accidents happen. All right, now what? Analyze your insurance inventory sheet. So this is something that you will want to create. Take a piece of paper, an Excel sheet, depending on how organized you are, and take an inventory sheet of what you have in your home, your apartment. And the reason you want to do this is because if you have homeowners or renters insurance, you'll want pictures, you'll want values, so that if something happens to your property, you can actually give it to the insurance company so that they can review it and provide you the best dollars for what you have spent. That is where an insurance, what's really great with our cell phones is they have cameras. You can take videos of what you have. If you had a, a really expensive electric bike, if you have a $8,000 bicycle in your garage, you want to make sure that you have taken pictures of that and you have some type of insurance. Um, auto insurance review, make sure that you're reviewing that annually, maybe every six months. Health insurance, that's always something that you want to review as well. All right. Plan. Now what? We're going to plan for our home inventory, future insurance needs, health insurance comparison, set yourself up with notifications within your financial industry for your checking, savings, and credit cards, and develop a plan to review and implement. Set reminders to review annually or every six months your policies. Make adjustments if necessary. This is very common. And this really affects uh, dollars as well. And that ends our workshop. Thank you everyone for joining me this afternoon. It's been a pleasure. Lori, <clears throat> thank you so much. It is always a pleasure. Really appreciate it. I, many years ago, experienced uh, credit card theft. Um, mis mystery purchases 
uh, online from London. And as much as I would love to say I was in London at that time, it wasn't me. So these are uh, such great tips. I took some notes myself. Great. And thank you everyone for joining. Um, hope everybody enjoys the rest of your day. Yes, enjoy this beautiful weather in Oregon. <laughs> It's very Portland out there. Very Portland. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Have a great day, everyone. Bye for now.